This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Shall we just open the discussion to everybody or should we give priority to the speakers if they would like to each other? Okay. <laughs> would you like to respond um, now or would you like to leave it? If you have anything immediate to say, maybe you can say now. Claire. Um, if I can, just, just jump in, I just thought, I thought what Deborah said was absolutely right. Um, and I've been thinking about it a lot uh, because I've been thinking about Henry Mantel a lot, who's a very wonderful and interesting writer in all sorts of ways. But also, um, <coughs> to add to your point about, I, I've been so struck recently by a lot of my students saying that they really uh, don't want to be a mother, but actually they see that as, they see that because they're, they're very young, these are undergraduates, and they see that as, as kind of unproblematic. So I wonder to what extent it, is that there's a kind of difference there. You, you stressed that. Is it, is it unproblematic for, the, for, the, for, the, for the, your students who are responding to this article, the idea that they would not be the first? Is it unproblematic? Yeah. No, because they they feel that um, that it's not um, it's not an equally valued choice to not be a mother. Right. Right. They, and, and well, some of them Well, they're older, yeah. they're a bit older yeah. than yeah. 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 Sorry, just to come in on that, yeah. I... I I agree, Deborah, um, that there, are, there is an, an assumption, certainly in my paper, that uh, women, as, uh, women and mothers can be used interchangeably. And the reason, and I need to detangle that, and I need to actually unpack those kind of issues. Uh, but one thing that is, is clear in terms of the policies is that the two groups are conflated. As Absolutely. Well. And that is why it's actually important to unpack those kind of assumptions within the policy itself. Because uh, it, what we do now in terms of graduates now, uh, women tend in the pay gap women uh, coming out of uh, university education now uh, earn slightly more than young men graduating right now. And that was a survey that came out last year. However, the tables that are turned uh, at the point in which women have children. Mm -hmm. So there is, uh, A, there is the assumption that women will have children. Um, whether or not women choose to have children or not, there is an assumption from the employers that women yeah. will have children. Yeah. And the state still relies on women to have children, in a way, uh, certainly for economic growth. So the two need to be, the issues really need to be unpacked. And actually, I think it speaks to the gender ideology that I was talking about and how reliant it is on women actually being prepared to fulfill that kind of function of mothering. So yes, it is not seen as, a, as an equally valid choice. Um, but I think it is interesting in terms of the age group. Yeah. And I think we should not discount the impact that age actually has mm -hmm. on women's expectations and understanding of the structures and the impact they have on their choices <coughs> and how they limit their future choices. Um, so as undergraduates, um, there is, a, I think, a degree of naivety that um, women in their late 20s, early 30s actually already start to become aware of the reality that they're being faced with in relation to employment and other others' perceptions of their role, whether or not they want to take it on themselves. Okay, Nisa, would you like to say anything? Just to add to the end of that conversation, I think that was one of the big outcomes of Rachel Thompson's three-year generational study, which is that age has emerged as the key marker of the difference between experiences and uh, opportunities around them. And I suppose I, I kind of began my paper by really situating motherhood as making trouble for feminism, and I think it continues to do that, and I think it's exactly the way that, that Deborah has highlighted. It is one of those nodes or points through which, it's, you know, actually complicated conflicts between women to get uh, worked out and discussed. And I don't know if it's, if it's the nettle that hasn't been grasped and I think there have been so many attempts 
in feminist history too, grows up. Certainly someone like Lindsay who will, will talk very explicitly about the constant erasure of the second wave work around the return mm -hmm. and has to be re-remembered in each generation. There's an oddness about our lack of capacity to hold on to the history of feminist debates and work around the way that motherhood mustn't get used as a kind of mode of splitting. But, but you know, I, I feel that it's structurally, you know, we, with things like race and sexuality, there was a moment where we had to face up to the fact that it was structural. But with motherhood, I think, that, I mean, there were, I was, I was in some of those debates, and I was, I was looking at, again, one thing I was particularly looking at, was one of the most impressive but also depressing books I ever read on this subject, which was Ros Coward's Our Treacherous Hearts, mm -hmm. which essentially argues that, um, that sort of the, the hideous competition among mothers or, or whatever, that, that it, women's endless unmet need for autonomy and power is channeled under certain social conditions into certain ways of mothering. So this would on the whole tend to be a class phenomenon as well as a, a gendered one. And you know, she gets to the end of the book and she's presented what I think is really this very compelling analysis and it's partly, it is psychosocial as you'd expect from Rose Coward. It's about you know, what, we, what we need in our mental lives as well as what the social conditions are. Right? And then at the end she basically says, and there's nothing you can do about this really. You know, it's a, it's, it'll go on forever. So I, I think many of the old socialist feminists became terrible pessimists actually. Um, you know, saying, okay, now we understand it, we realise that, that the reproduction of the species will cease if we need you to do anything <laughs> radical about it. So, so you know, I think, we, I think we never got to that, that point. But it is at the intersection of, it's tremendously personal as well as, as political, it's, it is at the intersection of the body and culture, motherhood, I mean. And so I think it has been a very difficult level to grasp if you disagree on it. And now we've got all this liberal crap about choice. Sort of substituting for any kind of analysis of, it, of what we do. So we should respect other women's choices, but what if they structurally position us in opposition? We've realised that this is the case with things like race, and that we have to talk about it, but we're reluctant to talk about it, I think, in the case of motherhood. And, and you know, it's complicated also because it, it, it positions the mother as oppressed in some ways and as powerful in others. So it's not a simple position. Yeah, I just want to say that one thing that has also been unsaid is that. Motherhood is not just about mothers, you know, it's about fathers as well. Mm -hmm. So why are we assuming that this nodal point, this terrible depression, remains the case because motherhood becomes a team as a woman entirely and that becomes her identity and the complete identity and commitment of her life to that project is somehow her identity. Why on earth are we asking the basic question, you know, okay, we're never going to get to ectogenesis in our lifetimes, we're never going to get to, get to babies and bottles, but, you know, there are alternative ways of looking after children. There is no need for women to endure themselves, to prostrate themselves. But that is the debate that is never had publicly. I think that's another debate. Okay, so any observations or questions from the floor? Yes, just to follow on from that, um, I think for anthropology, then that, that's a very big issue in anthropology, in the fact that motherhood focuses on biology, yes. and, and the distinction between motherhood and mothering, yes. and mothering, anybody can do mothering. Yes. Um, and in the field work that I do, which is an escape for Indian mothers in Portugal, yes. I've listened to all the papers and thinking how interesting it is to make a contrast with the way mothering is seen in the Cape Verdean perspective, and also how Portuguese society sees Cape Verdean mothers. You know, so how you, so the, sort of the, Euro, the European, the focus on the European mother in contrast with seeing the other mother from other, other cultures. And what's interesting about my research is that focusing on student mothers, many of them unexpected pregnancies, and how they feel empowered through these unexpected pregnancies and observing um, appointments that they have, for example, with social workers who talk to them as if they are irresponsible, completely disempowered because they've become pregnant, saying to them, do you understand what it means to become a mother? Are you aware of the responsibility? And they say, well, <coughs> I've, helped, I've looked after my own children ever since I was whatever else. So very, very different, very, very different perspectives on, on what mothering means. And I think that's also very interesting, talking about um, 
mother, your mother in Europe, how, because of migration, which obviously will be in another workshop, but um, you know, what the other in that context brings to, to the debate. Thank you. Clarifying this aspect, yes. Other than interventions, <coughs> yes. I was going to say, I have to come in late. I want to have some sick time. <laughs> but I did manage to catch Deborah's summary of the paper. Um, I wanted to raise with Deborah this idea that you were talking about women's power being minimised. Um, I actually have a more possibly a more pessimistic view of it, which from my research on the family courts. Um, a very good discourse emerging not only in men's rights groups but also among some of the judiciary is that women have too much power. Mm -hmm. That um, you know, women, women's power over children is uh, historically unchallenged and must now be challenged. Mm -hmm. And I have a, a very, I am, I'm quite scared when I read all of this stuff, particularly when you see uh, people like the head of you know, the family court division picking up on it. That in fact what is perceived as women's power, which is not in fact power, as we know single mothers are the least powerful women, in our society, um, will be used as a means of further diminishing women's status. You know, as we get into sort of neoliberal privatisation, we're getting a discourse that, well, fathers can do it just as well. And my fear is that we're heading back to a sort of even the sort of 18th century, 17th century conception in which the father owns the child, and in fact, you know, I mean, that's an extreme. Yeah, I'm, all, I'm also um, bothered by the resurgence of militant fathers' rights mm. movement. And um, I was quite surprised to see the coalition budget kind of giving some aid, some aid and comfort to those people. Though I don't think. Are you really surprised? I think it's really quite conservative movement. <laughs> oh, it's totally conservative. I was still I was still surprised that they bothered mm -hmm. because of some of the things that, that Roberta's talking about in terms of austerity. It probably won't make any great difference. No. However, I was talking about the power relations between women who are and who aren't mothers. It's in that context, really, that, that, um, that I see it as a bit of a gap or a silence that we don't talk about the power that one can wield from the position of a mother. For reasons which I would, I would also see as politically conservative, you know, mums, they do the most important job in the world. We don't pay them, but, <laughs> but we will kind of give them... You know, if I hear one more thing about how government policy is for hard-working families, I don't, you know... They, one part of demographic change is that there are fewer and fewer hard-working families because there are more and more single households yes. or, um, you know, or people who are not uh, married or living with anybody. And so it's sort of a fantasy discourse, but it does, it does produce a certain sort of power. Also, I think that, that certain forms of mothering do produce power over the, over the child in a very privatised and individualised, commodifying kind of way. Uh, but I'm not disputing your point that there's a, that in the kind of tussle between mothers and fathers, there's been some shifting of the uh, mm. of the terms recently, and not in a good way. Yeah, I mean, it is patriarchal in the classic sense of that. It's patriarchal, but through a very strange discourse of you know men are just as good at nurturing, and in fact women's rights have gone too far as you know the usual men's rights are. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any more? Okay, I will ask Lisa a question then, if you, if it's okay. I was wondering, in um, um, in response to uh, what Never has been telling us about not <coughs> talking about power, um, could you maybe clarify the issue of maternal power in relation to Ettinger? Because I'm not sure uh, I haven't read her, but I seem to remember that uh, in Benjamin we find that uh, Benjamin often refers, when we, she talks about real mothers occasionally in her book, she refers to women as being prey to all the discourses of, of motherhood and, you know, uh, women who are either powerful because they are career women so they reject motherhood, or they are women who are victims and uh, leave motherhood as a, power, a, a position of powerlessness. But what about Ettinger? Does she, the mother that has to defend her, I mean, the ambivalence, is there their power that needs to be also checked rather than just powerlessness? It's a really good question. I mean, in a way, we have to, because Benjamin works, as you say, in a, across a kind of psychosocial divine, so she's, she's concerned with actual mothers who go out and do things in the world and come back to mother their children, so that's the kind of paradigm she's talking about. And Ettinger's really working in a more psychological tradition that's really thinking about the 
place of internal and psychic life. And I don't think, and just particularly her writing into a kind of discussion about mothers as sort of fleshy and embodied subjects. But she has some very interesting thoughts about trying to rework um, what are basically patriarchal um, accounts of primal fantasy, for example, which she reworks by thinking about this figure of the mother monster, the devouring mother okay. monster, that is a, a, you know, runs through a, a certain kind of psychoanalytic theorizing, whereby the mother is basically set up as always already in a, in a um, kind of dangerous position to the developing psyche of the infant. And she tries to recast those um, fant fantasies as that as primal fantasies. So she's saying there's a, there's a way in which we have to recognize that mothers are placed in psychic life in a certain position, very, very powerful position, that needs to be recognized as a primal fantasy and therefore to be absolutely and fundamentally worked through. And what we mustn't do is make the mistake of misrecognizing the primal fantasy for the actual mother in early uh, in, in people's early lives. I suppose, I mean, to go back on what I said, she does do good work around, on the couch, really trying to not engage in a mother blame discourse. And she's basically saying, no, we need to make, we need to understand what a primal fantasy is and how it functions in order, actually, to revalorize actual maternal work. And she's constantly talking about the ways that those two things get needed. So she's very against the therapeutic practice that wants to know what did your mother actually do to you? Yeah. She's not interested in what I mean, she's interested, but she's interested mostly in terms of, <coughs> of maintaining that those aspects of psychic life. So that's where the political bit of her work is, I suppose, is that she sort of enacts a form of anti mother learning through the theoretical strategies. And she the last big piece she wrote, which we published in is that it's a maternal really talks to therapists. I mean she's saying, stop doing this. Stop doing yeah. that. <coughs> so that's a way to that is very interesting because the whole problem is um, also from my point of view I've worked on mother daughter relationship uh, mother daughter relationships it, the problem is also with you know the, the the theory just doesn't seem we don't seem to get to be able to get to grips with looking at mothers in a different way as women as feminists and I thought that, however that the the Benjamin's uh, into subjectivity actually could work well in a in a maybe in therapy because it could open the, the space to mothers and daughters attempting to work through their problems and each looking at the other in their context and understanding <coughs> their position. And um, so in a way the the the, neg the negative well, what has been um, emphasized in Benjamin's uh, um, problem, you know, I mean, that's problematic in Benjamin's theory, in a way, can be said, or can be used positively, you know, you know her pattern, her model, in maybe the therapeutic role. Sure, right. Yeah, and um, is, what does Ettinger uh, promote in her practice? Well, she promotes, I think, what, what I just said, which was, is, is a way of trying to understand therapeutic work as a, a journey towards understanding what remains rather than what needs to be objected, and that includes being subjective and that kind of figure. Well, what, you, okay. what you just said about Benjamin, is, it sounds like a version of a kind of family therapy, something like that, where you might work with once and daughter's yes. wife in the yes. room. And I think there are lots of projects that have been set up based on just the Benjamin's okay. work that do attempt to do that. Yeah. And I, I think but I think that's a slightly different project from what I took this going to do, which is to, is to change the theoretical base, to adequately change the theoretical base, so that we don't fall into the same assumptions about the world of the material um, There is one other, oh, shall we take, there is another question, so we take it and then we stop. Yeah, yeah just reminding me as well of the very interesting thing about the psychic destructive attacks, about, you know, that I want you to stay here, don't leave me. And how, and how interesting that the, the Cape Verdean case can be to give a, a contrast to this where it's perfectly normal for a mother to leave her child behind. Perfectly normal. It has become normalized. Obviously, there's a wider context because of poverty, 
because, because, because of the context of Cape Verde mass migration, but it has become something that is culturally acceptable and not looked down upon. And you know, it's not sort of, um, you're not a bad mother if you leave your child. And, and in Portuguese society, you know, it, it's a terrible thing. It's looked upon badly if a young student mother decides to send her baby back to Cape Verde to be cared for by her family while she continues her studies. Oh, the separation, and it's very interesting because this example helps us to sort of unpack this um, the biological and the cultural being locked together. That you know, if you're the if you're the mother, then you shouldn't be separated from your baby. And Cape Verde gives a very and other countries to the Caribbean that give a very um, widespread um, case of, of how this is actually seen as normal. Okay. So on this note, we stop here and have coffee. Thank you very much.